Today, I want to take a look at the ridiculous state of the video game industry in 2020. Now, ridiculous to you might be a good thing, it might be a bad thing. To me, it's a very exciting thing because there's a lot of stuff happening this year between Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft. However, it is ridiculous. <laughs> For some of it, you just have to wonder what is happening. I am going to take a deep dive look into Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft today. Both Sony and Microsoft have new systems coming out late this year. I want to take a look at those and go through everything we know about them. Like the Xbox not having any exclusives for its first year. What kind of choice is that? And how are people okay with... I'm gonna get to it. <laughs> Sony, who just today pulled out of E3 for the second year in a row. And finally, Nintendo, the big one, the big question that everyone has this year, will we see a Nintendo Switch Pro? Regardless of how ridiculous I find a lot of this, there's no denying I am very excited for this year. So despite whatever happens this year with these systems, I will be picking up every single one on launch, and I'm really, really excited for that. Hey dude, you gotta hear this! Duh! Why? What am I doing in this room all of a sudden? And why are my clothes different? Never mind that, you idiot! I said you gotta hear this! Um, dude, I'm a little busy right now, apparently. I'm reading Supermarket by Bobby Hall. How did I get here? <laughs> Reading? What is this? 1995? There's a version of that book on Audible that you can listen to. It's even narrated by the author himself. You busted in here at 2 a.m. to read a sponsor spot. No matter what your goal or resolution is this year, you'll find the perfect audiobook on Audible to motivate and inspire you. So that's a yes. And to help motivate you, Audible is issuing a challenge to new members and existing members. If you finish three audiobooks by March 3rd, you'll get $20 of Audible credit. <laughs> and you can start listening with a free 30-day trial. Oh no, now he's got me doing it. Look, you can get one audiobook and two Audible Originals for free. Just visit audible.com forward slash beatemups or text beatemups to 500, 500 Oh really? That does sound pretty good. I don't need this anymore. What else does Audible have to listen to? <laughs> Everything, my guy. It's an unmatched selection. Why? What do you have in mind? Audible is awesome. Let's start with Sony, because there is a lot of PlayStation 5 talk happening right now. As I said, before we get to the system itself, the news of Sony's not going to E3 again this year, which it doesn't super surprise me, but I really didn't expect it to happen again. The reason why it doesn't super surprise me is, well, it happened last year, and I thought at the time there was more to it than Sony just not having enough to show. Which is what a lot of people put it down to as, because it's at that strange change over time between generations where PlayStation 4 doesn't have much left to come out. So it made sense to me that Sony didn't want to go, but then not going again this year, for me, that's starting to get ridiculous, that's starting to look a little bit like the nail in the coffin for E3. Which is a conversation that maybe should be had in another video at another time, considering the context of what I want to talk about in this video, but since it is such a hot fresh topic, I do want to say, E3, as much as I love it, it's not necessary anymore. I mean, we have things like Nintendo Directs and State of Plays, and essentially even a tweet from a company now can blow up and go viral. Companies don't need these huge events to draw attention like they used to before the internet became as crazy as it is. I mean, Nintendo can tweet out a picture of Mario eating a watermelon with his socks off, and it goes viral with people questioning Mario's feet, but also questioning whether there's gonna be a Mario Sunshine coming to Switch. That's all it took. They didn't need a big event, they didn't need a director in E3, they just needed one tweet. So E3 being such an expensive event for someone like Sony to have to put on, then gets crapped on because they didn't win E3 when they could have just stayed at home and tweeted out Alloy's feet. <laughs> After thorough evaluation, SEI has decided not to participate in E3 2020, said a Sony spokesperson. We have great respect for ESA as an organization, but we do not feel the vision of E3 2020 is the right venue for what we are focused on this year. So yeah, they're just not going. Something I find um 
kind of sad <laughs> is E3's response, their announcement to Sony. It just says E3 statement on Sony at E3 2020. So it seems like they're going to address Sony not showing up since that's what this is titled on the ESA's website. But they just talk about E3 is going to be an exciting high energy show with new experiences. They don't actually even mention Sony. It's just, we still have a really cool event. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Let's move along and talk about the PlayStation 5, what we know about it, and why I'm so excited for it. Something that excites me is quotes like from the CEO of Sony saying, with every new console, the processor and graphics get better, which is of course compelling, but we need to have unique elements too. Like, essentially saying they want bigger differences between the PlayStation 5 and PlayStation 4 being more innovative in what the system can do rather than just being a powerhouse of a machine which is kind of what I feel like Xbox tries to do, not discrediting them because I love my Xbox One X because of the powerhouse it is. Whereas PlayStation likes to improve in that area, but also like to be innovative. And I think that's a nice mix of what I look for in a gaming company. I mean, Nintendo is very innovative, Xbox is very powerhouse, and PlayStation tends to find that middle ground, which I think is why I love Sony as much as I do. It will be backwards compatible with PlayStation 4. That is massive. I mean, you never know going into new generations now if you'll be able to play all the games you just bought over the last five years but you can at least play PlayStation 4 and there's rumors and talks about it being completely backwards compatible and being able to play back to PlayStation 1 games but it's more rumors than it is confirmed. I'm just happy with PlayStation 4 honestly. A patent for the PlayStation 5 controller was also found and it's essentially the same. They removed the light bar. Thank goodness. I hate that light bar on the PlayStation 4 controller. It was just an annoying shining light I couldn't get rid of that reflected in my TV when I tried to play at night. So that's gone, and a couple of new features the PlayStation 5 controller will have is haptic feedback, which kind of reminds me of HD Rumble on Switch, where it's more responsive. They say you'll be able to feel things like textures as you're walking through a field of grass or when you're trudging through mud. And then adaptive triggers, so you can actually feel the tension as you draw a bow and arrow, or you hit the gas on a car on rocky terrain. I like that, it brings you into the game more, it's more immersive. When asked about VR, PlayStation didn't really want to talk about that, but they did say that they feel very passionate about it. Your PlayStation VR headset you have now for your PS4 will work on the PlayStation 5, and I think it's obvious, they may have even mentioned it, they are going to be working on a new PSVR headset coming at some point this year, I believe. Also, with Last of Us 2 being pushed back and Ghost of Tsushima not having a release date yet, people are speculating whether or not these will be simultaneously released with the PlayStation PlayStation 5. I mean, at this point, even though they have given release dates to Last of Us pretty early this year, I don't think it's a bad idea to hold off and wait. I mean, that's what Nintendo did with Breath of the Wild. It was probably ready a lot longer before it was actually released, but they waited because they were so close to the new system and then they cross-released it. And even though it's on both systems, a lot of people still went out and bought it on the new system and bought the new system to play it because they wanted that better experience. And Last of Us is one of those games that would definitely have a lot of people doing that because it's Last of Us. And then, shocking the entire world, PlayStation revealed the new logo for PlayStation 5. And it's exactly what you would have thought it would have looked like. <laughs> Duh. Very excited for this. Very excited. But let's move on. Let's save Xbox to last as most people tend to do, and start next on Nintendo. Last year, we had all those rumors about a possible Switch Pro. Actually, what we had rumors of were two revisions of the Switch. What was looking most likely was a Switch Lite, Switch Mini kind of thing, and then an improved version of the Switch. The Switch Lite launched, it released, it was announced, and everyone was like, okay, let's cross that off the list. So there must be, from the same sources that predicted this mini, there must actually be a pro revised version, a better version of the Switch on the way. Then Nintendo announced and released that slightly updated bigger battery life version of the Switch. It was a revision, it was technically a better improved version of the Switch it had double the battery life. And that ended up being what all these rumors and reports led to. It was that switch, which kind of drew a line in the sand and ended the conversation of, is there a pro coming? There was no longer any evidence. There was no factories working on parts for a new switch. There was just nothing. So everyone stopped talking about it until I swear January 1st rolled around and we, we entered a new year. And then it, of course it exploded again with, oh no, there's gonna be a switch pro 
this year. But it all seems to just be coming from, as far as I could see, and I could be wrong, one Twitter account and just rumors. So sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but someone on Twitter called Sirkan Toto said, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that Nintendo will launch a Switch Pro in 2020. My guess is at $399. More specifically, I predict 4K support, bigger cartridge sizes, and of course, beefed up components. Expect big things in 2020 from Nintendo. Now, I had no idea who this guy was, so I looked him up, and apparently he is in the industry, and it's kind of what he does. He predicts things. He's an analyst. And there was a whole report on everything he predicted last year from not just Nintendo, but everything from Xbox, Sony, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of his predictions ended up being true. And a lot of it, I think, is based on things he knows, things he hears, and end of the day, just anal analytics. Like, just looking at the way things have gone in the past, how things seem to be moving now, and making predictions based on analytics. <laughs> and then DigiTimes reported on this too, saying that Nintendo is working on a model planned to be released in mid-2020, with production beginning at the end of first quarter 2020, which means sometime around March. The news lines up with previous reports from Wall Street Journal technology reporter Takashi. I'm not even gonna try and butcher that last name. I suck at pronouncing names. Nintendo has ideas for further updates to the Switch lineup after those two models, he's talking about the Switch Lite and the slight revision we got, to make the platform's life cycle longer. I don't know how to feel about this. It's all rumors, I am not believing it, but I'm not opposed to the idea either. I think it is definitely possible. This is something Nintendo has dabbled in before, many a times. I mean, the most recent one that I can draw correlation to is the same one you probably are with Nintendo 3DS and the new Nintendo 3DS when Nintendo released a version of this handheld system which was better. It had a better CPU, it was capable of more, it even had a few exclusive games for that system. So yeah, it's absolutely something Nintendo at least has on their mind, something they have thought about before. Whether or not they will do it is another thing, but it does make sense to do it. But we're going into this year, we haven't really heard much about Nintendo. Sony and Microsoft are releasing new systems, and up until this point, the Switch, while being an underperforming console as opposed to the current generation of systems, we've looked past that because of what it's capable of that those systems aren't capable of. And it still will be capable of something that the new generation aren't, but it's always felt like it's hanging in there. Like it's the little brother punching up above its weight. You're never really sure of what it's capable of and it always manages to surprise you somehow in this generation. And while the Switch has managed to stay relevant and current and seem like the hot fresh new thing, as soon as these new systems launch that are gonna be powerhouses, you're just going to look at the Switch as the previous generation. Is that a bad thing? No, I don't think so. But if Nintendo can capitalize on all this hype and put out something new, it could be really exciting and it could help the Switch hold on throughout this next generation, which is something that I think Nintendo wants to do. They expand the lifespan of what the Switch is so they don't have to put out another whole new console Again, I got, they have to reset in a couple years. I think they kind of want to wait out this next generation too. That's what it's everything they keep saying about expanding the Switch past what is a typical lifespan for a system. I think the route Nintendo's going to want to go down is a Switch that can do and play everything that the Switch can now and everything the Switch will be able to play, the Switch family of systems, without, without isolating itself and getting a bunch of new games that other systems can't play. Just be a part of that generation, be a part of that family, but it's able to do more with the games that it has. Alternatively, you could think about it in regards to, okay, the Switch Lite removed the ability to dock and be a Switch. What if we go further in that direction on the other end, where we have a Switch Pro new Super Switch that just sits at home as a home console? Nintendo's able to beef it up more, it's able to do more, it just sits at your TV, you put the cartridges in and it plays it at that point. Sure, you I mean you could look at 4K, you could look at a lot of things, or even maybe just a dock, because if you don't know, when you dock your Switch and it plays on the TV, the dock is actually capable of pushing your Switch a little bit further, upscaling games, running them a little bit better. Do we look at maybe just a dock upgrade that's able to push the Switch even further? There's so many different ideas, concepts, and possibilities when it comes to upgrading the Switch. But at the end of the day, it hasn't been announced, and it's just a rumor. So if it doesn't happen, what does Nintendo have in store this year? Imagine if Breath of the Wild 2 launched 
the same day and time as a Switch Pro model. That would be exciting, or even just Breath of the Wild 2 would be exciting, or a Pro model would be exciting, but we don't know about any of this. But Nintendo themselves have given us no reason to be excited this year. I don't, that, don't, don't, take that, don't take that the wrong way. I am still excited to see what happens and I have faith, but that's all I have right now. Faith. And only three years in, that's kind of ridiculous. So I'm very interested by Nintendo this year. And finally, Xbox. Oh boy. <laughs> Xbox and Microsoft is in a really weird place going into this generation because they are this generation's Wii U to Nintendo Switch from last generation. <laughs> With people kind of hurt by the Xbox One and not knowing if they should trust Xbox with the next console. And immediately right out the gate, I don't think Microsoft has given anyone a reason, a solid reason to go out and buy the Xbox Series X unless you are just a big Xbox fan and you're really looking to beef up your, your gaming experiences with a new powerhouse of a system. What I'm getting at is Microsoft has said the Xbox Series X will have no exclusive games for the first year. Meaning, all the games released on Xbox Series X will also be playable and released on the Xbox One. The Xbox and PC family of consoles will be able to play all the games released on Xbox Series X. I think it's actually a sign of, of good things from Microsoft. I actually think it's a sign that they are trying their hardest to be as accessible to as many gamers as possible and not exclude anyone like they did with the Xbox One. It's really a huge turnabout for them, and I think they are just trying to show good faith going into this next system. It's a way to not exclude anyone. They've said they don't want any customers of the Xbox One, both up until now and for the next year or so, to feel like they regret their purchase, to feel like they shouldn't have bought an Xbox One right now. And again, it's just, it's a weird turnabout. But when the Xbox One was being released, they were so adamant on internet, being online all the time. You had to have internet. If you didn't have internet, their Xbox One was gonna be a brick. Don't bother buying it, was the mindset. There was even an interview with Don Matrick, and I believe he was let go after this, where he was asked, okay, so what happens if you don't have internet and Don said himself in this interview which still blows my mind to this day we have a product for those people people that don't have an internet and that product is called the Xbox 360. Fortunately we have a product for people who aren't able to get some form of connectivity it's called Xbox 360. Ooh, and I remember watching that live and like I shivered I was like oh that's not what you say no 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 you are getting fired there's no way that's okay and now going into this new generation it's the complete opposite now you don't even need to get the new one. Don't even worry about getting the new one. And they've only said for the first year, but they didn't say only the first year. They just said that for the first year. So could it be two years? Could it be three years? Could it be the lifespan of the system? I doubt it. At some point, they're gonna wanna utilize this thing. I'm just wondering when. But here is what we do know about the Xbox Series X. And again, it's not as much as PlayStation. It'll be releasing around the same time as PlayStation 5 in holiday 2020. Even though we've all seen it as this giant tower of a machine, it will be able to lie down as well, which was my first question looking at it because I have a TV cabinet my my TV sits on. I can't fit that anywhere. It's gonna have to lie on its side. So hopefully that doesn't make it overheat for me or something. It'll have four times the processing power of Xbox One X. I take it back. That's the reason. That's the reason I'm buying it. That's crazy. I don't know how many of you have the Xbox One X, but it makes the games look so much better and play it. I have, oh my gosh. It will support 4K gaming up to 120 FPS. It will also support a custom AMD processor and also have a solid state drive. We also know that Ninja Theory is releasing Hellblade 2 on the system, which came as way too much of a surprise for me. I didn't even think about getting a sequel to that game or the fact that Microsoft bought Ninja Theory at some point last year. So yeah, this makes a lot of sense. If you haven't seen the trailer for it, it's incredible and I've watched it at least 17 times. With Xbox One, what's the biggest complaint everyone says about Xbox One? The reason why they don't buy it. No games. No exclusive games. That's what every, that's the, uh, the big reason most people give the Xbox One for failing. Other than it's terrible launch, so telling me right out the gate, the Xbox Series X isn't going to have any exclusive games. I mean, yes, it's getting new games, and I'm sure it'll get loads of new games. 
I mean, Microsoft bought 14 new studios. I'm sure loads of new games are going to be releasing on Series X in that first year. They're just also going to be on Xbox One. So is that enough? How does that shake out? I don't know. It confuses me. It baffles me. I don't know how I feel about it. But I'm gonna have a Series X regardless, so whatever. <laughs> and that, as far as I'm aware, is all the biggest, most exciting questions <laughs> that we all have and the information that we all have from these three companies going into 2020. I'm sure there's other little tidbits of information, other little features here and there about the new systems. Either way, I have faith in Nintendo to pull something crazy out of nowhere. You don't even need faith in Sony. Sony's gonna do their thing and I'm excited to see what it is and I can't wait to be a part of it. And then Xbox, I love, I love, I love Xbox. It's, it's going to be ridiculous. I'm gonna go play some games now. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go try and play more Witcher 3. I'm not gonna say try and finish, because I know I'm nowhere near the end. I'm at least gonna go and play more Gwent. Oh, 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 oh. Hey, flip on that subscribe button and hit the like button if you're somehow here at this point and haven't done it yet. Okay, almost forgot all of that. Gwent time. Some other time, maybe.